Michelle Hai, Managing Editor, American Purpose. Michelle, thanks for getting us together today and opening the Zoom room. I'm Jeff Gedman with American Purpose, and I have looked forward to this period. It's going to be about 55 minutes, by the way, uh, for some time. <clears throat> Jeffrey Herb, I think many of you know, and <clears throat> you certainly know his work. I, I got to know Jeffrey Herb's work earlier in my career because of the splendid research and writing he was doing on Europe and on Germany and on the intersection of politics and culture and defense policy for that matter. And in this case, Jeff Herf has produced a new and timely, and I'm given to understand, very uh, well-received and well-selling book, <clears throat> pardon me, titled Israel's Moment. Uh, there's been a great deal over the years, as you know, written about the founding of the state of Israel. This is a book that digs into new research, archival and otherwise, and offers fresh perspective. It's a great read. I have it, I purchased it on Kindle and I read it on my iPad. I can't hold it up to the screen, but you're going to see Jeff Herf hold it up in some moments as he begins his presentation. But I want to say welcome to everybody. Thanks for making time. And welcome to Jeff Herf. And congratulations, Jeff. We're eager to hear from you. And <clears throat> I'm going to ask at the outset, and then Jeff is going to take us where to as he sees fit. I'd like to know a little bit, Jeff, if you would, about the motivation in writing a book like this and writing it now. And if you would tell us a little bit about the method, and then I'm just packing this in because I'm gonna you know, turn the microphone over to you. Um, you and I have spoken about this. The book revisits material, sheds light on moments and actors and situations and challenges some assumptions. For me, it challenged some assumptions I had about that period that turned out to be wrong or misguided. So that's my welcome and introduction. We'll go to five minutes before the hour latest. And Jeff Herf, welcome and over to you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, I, it's a pleasure to speak to an American Purpose audience. I'm assuming that this audience is very familiar with American foreign relations. And uh, uh, so I'm gonna couch my, my remarks uh, at that level. Uh, the motivations for, uh, for writing this book were uh, twofold. Uh, first, I, as many of you know, I'm a historian of uh, modern German history and uh, uh, have written about the tradition of uh, frank reckoning uh, with the Nazi past. Uh, and the, the part of that tradition uh, is not only to remember uh, what Nazism was or what the Holocaust was, but um, as Theodore Adorno, a, a famous social theorist, put it, uh, uh, the purpose of education after Auschwitz is to see that it never happens again. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, uh, given the amount of antagonism uh, and hostility that uh, is directed at Israel from various quarters, I, uh, uh, I wanted to uh, uh, understand more of that. And I, I've written about uh, uh, the uh, the impact of Nazism in the Middle East. So that that was that was one motivation to pursue that. And uh, the second is a, a, another personal one, and that is that in the academy, I'm in the history department, University of Maryland, uh, and a member of the American Historical Association. Uh, over the last decade, uh, I've participated in op opposing efforts to boycott and divest and sanction the state of Israel, and had noted the arguments uh, that were made in favor of those resolutions that suggested that Israel was a product of American imperialism, that Zionism was a form of racism, uh, that the Palestine Arab cause was uh, one of leftist anti-imperialism. Uh, and uh, uh, in other words, that the ideas that were circulating on campuses, uh, both in Europe and Britain and the United States were, in my view, an academic form of uh, ideas first articulated by the Soviet Union and then the Palestine Liberation Organization in world politics in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and so given that those, those, in my view, misconceptions about the history of the establishment of the state of Israel were widespread, I thought it, that was another motivation 
we're wanting to uh, revisit these events. So it's it, it's a um, uh, a meaty book. It's 460 pages of t of text, another uh, 30 or so of notes. So he, here are, here are the uh, I I, I want to speak no more than 20 minutes today because I am because I I'm this is a to, uh, I, I want to hear your comments and questions. The there are um, I, I think uh, four uh, uh, fundamental points I want to make uh, uh, regarding the book. Uh, uh, Harry Truman is uh, famous uh, for having his support of the Zionist project, uh, and his support was important. But uh, the support from the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc uh, was more consequential than the support that came from the Truman White House. Uh, that support was evident in diplomatic battles at the United Nations, and uh, the United Nations documents and debates in the Security Council and General Assembly are an important aspect of the book. Sometimes some of the most important documents are the most public ones, not in the archives, and, uh, and that is the case with some of the UN files. Uh, the um, Israel's moment refers to a turning point in global politics from 1945 to 49, especially 47, 48, when the alliances of the Second World War and the anti-Hitler coalition gave way to the reversed uh, alliances of the early Cold War. And the Zionist project emerged uh, between the binaries of communism and anti-communism, and it confounded decision makers in Moscow, Paris, London, and Washington. But the short, brief moment of, when, of Israel's moment was well understood by future Prime Minister David Ben Gurion and future Foreign Minister Moshe Sherrod, and uh, one of the one of the, the results of writing this book is I come away with a renewed uh, admiration uh, for Ben Gurion and Sherrod. I think that they emerge as some of the most impressive figures of international politics in the 20th century, even in their very very small state. Uh, uh, second, uh, the um, uh, historians have not paid sufficient attention. Some, uh, 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 Peter Hahn has written a book about the State Department caught in the middle, but on the whole, uh, have not paid sufficient attention to uh, the emphatic, resolute, persistent, and consequential opposition to the establishment of the State of Israel in the United States State Department of Secretary of State George Marshall the director of the policy planning staff, George Kennan, uh, the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, and the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, uh, Marshall and Kennan, the, uh, the Arabis in the State Department, uh, the leaders of the Pentagon, all thought that the establishment of the Jewish state was a terrible idea from the perspective of American national security interests, that it would undermine Western and American access to Arab oil, and that the new Jewish state would be a boon uh, to Soviet expansion in the Middle East, and so uh, uh, thus undermine the policy of global uh, containment. The argument, the anti-communist argument um, of those years cut against the establishment of the Jewish state in the State Department and the Pentagon. Uh, uh, I'm gonna spend less time uh, on American domestic politics, uh, but, uh, but suffice it to say that the strongest support in the United States for establishing the Jewish state came from uh, liberals in Congress, especially led by Senator Robert Wagner of New York and the Congressman Emanuel Seller of Brooklyn. Um, uh, journalists such as the editor of The Nation magazine, uh, the left-wing flagship, Rita Kirchway, I.F. Stone, uh, a well-known left-leaning, liberal left-leaning uh, uh, journalist, the then very left-leaning Popular Front newspaper, uh, Daily PM, the then left liberal New York Post. Um, and uh, uh, that, that I, that, those chapters of the book that deal with the momentum in favor of the Zionist project uh, from the New York and Washington liberals will perhaps come as a bit of a surprise. Um, uh, Senator Robert Taft, and uh, there were some Republicans, uh, Rockefeller type Republicans, uh, who supported the establishment of the Jewish state, a younger Jacob Javits, for example. Um, 
and I don't I, I, I cite them as well. And uh, Taft's Zionism is is has been documented by other historians. But the real the core of support, the most passionate, uh, persistent domestic support came from uh, liberals in the United States who viewed the establishment of the Jewish state as a continuation of the spirit of wartime anti-fascism. Uh, and uh, some of the most interesting aspects of the early part of the book have to do with the mobilization in New York City uh, to indict Haja bin al-Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, uh, for uh, war crimes on the basis of his incitement to mass murder uh, in world-famous radio broadcasts uh, that he made in Arabic uh, from Nazi Berlin. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the combination of the New York liberals and the American Zionist Emergency Council uh, presented a great deal of evidence to the State Department in 1945, 1945 and 1946 uh, regarding Husseini's involvement in uh, collaboration with the Nazi regime. Husseini was important uh, because at the time in 1945-46, he also was under house arrest in Paris. The French foreign ministry had him under house arrest and the French foreign ministry uh, resisted uh, the pleas of American liberals uh, to indict him and send him uh, to the Nuremberg trials. The non-indictment of Husseini, in my view, uh, was a very important uh, event. Uh, had he been indicted, had there been a trial of the, quote, what was then called the Mufti, I think that the collaborationist history of the Arab higher committee, the Palestine Arab leadership, not all Palestinians, I want to make that very clear, not all Palestinians, but the leadership of the Arab higher, the, the Nazi collaborationist past of those people would perhaps have enhanced the possibility for moderate leaders in uh, Palestine to come to the fore rather than the Muslim Brotherhood radicals who were the driving force of the war of 1948. I think it was a major strategic blunder on the part of Marshall and Kennan and the others uh, that they did not support uh, such a trial. I think it would have benefited American national security interests enormously. And and possibly enhance the possibility of the success of a two-state solution in 1947-48. Another important theme of the book, which uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I can't go into in, in the detail that it merits, is the question of race and racism. And you all know that Zionism has been accused of being a racist tradition and and uh, 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 phenomenon. Uh, the uh, what what has been neglected uh, is the racism of the Palestinian, Palestine Arab leadership. Uh, and one of the most important documents in that regard is a speech made by Jamal Husseini, who was the representative of the Arab Higher Committee at the United Nations, uh, a speech he gave first in January of 47 that was known to the State Department. And then he gave uh, the same speech in New York in uh, late September of 47. And uh, the who, Jamal Husseini described uh, the Arab world as a territorial continuity inhabited, I'm quoting, inhabited by a homogeneous population with one national outlook. As such, it is free from serious frictions and a natural bulwark for peace. Homogeneity in race, he said, has always been the natural basis for mutual understanding and community of interest. In other words, Jamal Husseini. Uh, very clearly articulated the idea that uh, diversity, ethnic, religious, national diversity in the Middle East would be a formula for trouble, just as in his view, it had been a formula for trouble in Europe, and that homogeneity in race would be a formula for peace. Uh, uh, this very public, very important speech by Jamal Husseini has received almost no attention. Uh, in the history of uh, the conflict over uh, the causes of the war of 1948 uh, and the establishment of the state of Israel. And uh, I view the book as I, that early part of the book that deals with uh, the efforts by Freddie Kirchway and I have Stone and Emanuel Seller and Robert Wagner uh, uh, and other American uh, liberals to bring that issue of Nazi collaboration to the fore 
to be an important part of the book. Um, you are all, I would assume, familiar with Andrew Gromyko's famous speech of May of 1947, in which he stunned the United Nations by uh, uh, supporting uh, a uh, two states in Palestine. If the Arabs and the Jews could not get along in one state, then Gromyko said uh, the Soviet Union would support the establishment of an Arab state and a Jewish state. And uh, one of the features one of the aspects of those of those years that I found so striking was that from May of 47 to May of 49, when Israel was admitted to the United Nations, the Soviet Union never wavered uh, in its support for the partition plan. Uh, that is for an Arab state and a Jewish state. Uh, and I, uh, uh, Gromyko is famous and, and, and many of you are familiar with him, with his work. But I also found it very interesting that Alfred Fiedorkiewicz uh, the member of the Polish delegation, uh, stunned uh, one of the committees at the United Nations. Uh, he was chosen to be the vice president of the General Assembly. With Peter Kivich told the Assembly that he was a survivor of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Uh, and he had seen one and a half to two million Jews murdered there and spoke of the close bond that was formed between the Poles and the Jews. There's some romance there, of course. But uh, that as a result, uh, uh, he, uh, again, was strongly in favor of an Arab state in Palestine and a Jewish state in Palestine. So those records of the United Nations um, are uh, uh, an important part of the book. Um, the, um, uh, the liberals, Kirchway, Stone, Seller, Wagner, were very angry uh, at Marshall and Kennan uh, and uh, Loy Henderson, the State Department's policy. Uh, at the United Nations that kept criticizing it. Uh, why is the State Department so ambiguous about the partition plan? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, they made, uh, Stone and others made the, made the case that, uh, uh, and they were right, uh, based on public documents. And the archives demonstrated that, uh, that they were right, that the, uh, that the State Department's policy beginning in the summer and fall of 1947 was one of close, support for British policy. The Pentagon talks took place in September and October of 1947, and there Kennan, Loy Henderson, uh, uh, and uh, Robert Lovett met with their counterparts in British uh, military and diplomatic uh, leadership. And um, there, the, the upshot of the, of the Pentagon talks was that, as Marshall put it, the cornerstone of American policy in the Middle East uh, was to support the British policy. And the British policy, as you know, <clears throat> was to oppose the establishment of the state of Israel. George Kennan, uh, who you all are familiar with as a, the author of The Long Telegram and the author of uh, Containment, uh, brought the policy of the State Department Arabists, of Loy Henderson and others who had been ambassadors in Saudi Arabia and Egypt and other places, brought the Arabist policy to the level of a consensus within the State Department because it came now from Kennan. And Kennan was Kennan. Kennan was famous. And in January and February of 48, he wrote his typically eloquent and brilliant memos uh, uh, that have received far too little attention um, uh, from the policy planning staff in which he made the case that the United States should resist the partition plan uh, for the reasons that I stated above, that it would assist the Soviet Union, that the state of Israel would be a Trojan horse for the Soviet Union, that it would undermine access to Arab oil, uh, and that in every way, uh, the establishment of the Jewish state of Israel would not be in the interests of American foreign relations. Um, uh, just a few other comments with Ukraine in mind. Uh, uh, in June of 1948, uh, uh, the United Nations appointed a Swedish diplomat named uh, Count Volker Bernadotte to be the mediator between the Arabs and the Jews. And uh, the, the United Nations then engaged in various truce resolutions um, uh, and a plan called the Bernadotte Plan. Uh, and uh, the Bernadotte Plan uh, was... Um, 
a plan that would have revised the partition plan and taken the Negev desert away from Israel. Uh, in the summer of 48, Ukrainian SSR had a rotating position on the United Nations Security Council and Vasil Tarasenko, who after the war became the chair of the history department at the leading university in Kiev, uh, was Ukraine's ambassador to the United Nations. And with Andrei Gomiko, he fought the diplomatic fight against the British and the Americans who were supporting the Bernadotte plan. And uh, Tarasenko uh, said that the draft resolutions of May 48 were designed to stifle the state of Israel. Um, and uh, all the large arsenals of the United Kingdom would be at the disposal of the Arabs, a virtual blockade would be established around Israel. Uh, the whole draft resolution of the British and the Americans was biased and unacceptable. And I, I, I go, I, I mentioned Tarasenko uh, for our reasons that this audience understands perfectly well, which is that uh, Putin accused the Ukrainians of being Nazis. And uh, so Tarasenko uh, reminds us of the traditions of Ukrainian anti-fascism uh, that, uh, that, were, that, were, that were important. Last point uh, um, uh, is an anecdote. Uh, and, and again, it, it, as Jeff so generously pointed out, uh, this is a this this book is well written. I'm I, I, I'm not modest about this book. I, I, I'm very proud of it. Um, uh, those of you who are authors know you know when you've written a really good book, and you know uh, so uh, the this this is a good one. Uh, but it's detailed. It's not an easy re read, and it, it's the kind of book that that you this audience I think will appreciate. Uh, and, can, and can assess critically because you know a lot about the government and how it functions. Uh, in uh, May 1949, uh, David Ben-Gurion was irritating uh, Dean Rusk uh, and the State Department a great deal because uh, the Israelis in May of 49 were saying no when uh, the United Nations and the Americans, the British were saying you should let the the Palestine refugees back. And Ben-Gurion said, uh, well, if they want to sign a peace agreement with us and end the war, they're fine. You know, otherwise, no, not now. And uh, at that point, the State Department said, well, we're going to have an agonizing reappraisal here. And uh, the Israelis are being very difficult. We'd have to reevaluate our relationship with the Israelis. A pretty tough talk. And uh, in May of 49, the new ambassador to Israel, James McDonald, had a conversation with Ben Gurion and Moshe Sheriff, and in which he conveyed this on the unhappiness of the State Department. And uh, uh, Ben Gurion was not a, a man of long speeches. Uh, I don't think one would say Ben Gurion was enormously eloquent, but he was blunt and he got to the point. And he told McDonald basically this. Uh, the United States turned against the partition. The United States imposed an arms embargo on the region when we needed weapons. Uh, and then he said to McDonald, referring to the United States, if we, the Jews in Palestine and the state of Israel, had to depend upon the United States, and these are Ben-Gurion's words, we would have been exterminated. So there's a lot of romance uh, about the relationship between the United States and Israel in the early years. Uh, the alliance really with Israel didn't begin until 19, after 1967. Uh, but um, I, uh, uh, I think that's, uh, th th those are, the, those, those are the, the key themes of the book. The details are fascinating. I'll be glad to talk about them uh, uh, in, in, in greater detail. I think that the book has things to say about very famous events that are not common knowledge and that uh, that that uh, that I hope will 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 resonate uh, here in Washington and with people who, who follow these who follow foreign policy questions uh, um, closely. Thank you. Hey, hey Jeff, th thank you for that. That that was splendid. I want to start by asking you one question. You've spoken about figures like Kennan and Marshall and you've talked about the KDRSA and state and defense and, and of course, liberal public opinion, congressional opinion. Say a little bit more about Harry Truman. He figures in your account. 
he managed to combine anti-communism with pro-Zionism and quite obviously he was important. How did he come to his views and how did he reconcile some of these matters? Well, uh, I, I'm living here in suburbia and there's some lawn mowing going on. Can you hear the lawn mower in the background? No? No, but okay, we hear but, you. All right, good, fine. Um, the, um, uh, Truman, uh, and here I think that he, uh, he reminds, I, I, I would be, I wish obviously for many reasons that Franklin Roosevelt had lived longer, but uh, I'm just gonna close the window just a minute. It would be really interesting to have, to see Harry Truman and Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill at dinner and have them talk about uh, what they thought about the relationship between Christianity and the Second World War was. Because I think none of, none of these three leaders wore their religion on their sleeve, um, but they all, I think, implicitly understood that the Second World War was also a war about what Christianity uh, and that uh, that the final solution of the Jewish question uh, was a radicalization of Christianity and suggesting that this was uh, the final solution of the crime that began with the crucifixion. And Roosevelt and Churchill and Truman stood for a different kind of Christianity. Uh, the mainstream of Christianity, uh, philo-Semitic Christianity, a Christianity that saw Judaism as Christianity and Judaism as connected to one another. Uh, and so I think that that, I think that was important for Harry Truman. Uh, uh, and he viewed the establishment of the Jewish, he viewed the Holocaust as, uh, as an event in Western civilization. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that Western civilization was uh, implicated in it and that the establishment of the Jewish state was one necessary response. But, that was a moral, emotional response. And he was the president of the United States. So his primary responsibility was to defend the national security interests of the United States. And he needed a response. George Marshall was the most famous and, and prestigious person in the United States after Harry Truman. And George Kennan uh, was already famous as a brilliant diplomat. So he was up against it. And James Forrestal, the, the, the Secretary of, of I, don't, I don't know if it was Secretary of War or Secretary of Defense. Then. He was up against the entire national security establishment. And this is where Clark Clifford, his lawyer, uh, became, uh, had played an important role because Clifford made the argument that Truman needed to hear, which was, it was an argument that, uh, that liberals and Zionists in the United States Wagner was making, and that was that the state of Israel would be a democratic bastion in the Middle East, uh, supportive of the, uh, of the West uh, and the democracies, uh, that it would not be a Trojan horse for the Soviet Union, uh, that some of these accusations about Jews and the Soviet Union revived older anti-Semitic arguments about Jews and communism. Uh, and Clifford said, um, Washington lawyer that he was, that the Arabs can't make a dime if the oil is in the ground. They've got to sell it to somebody. Um, and the people they got to, the people with money to buy their oil are in Europe and the United States. So Mr. President, um, uh, on the basis of national security, economic security, um, supporting the, the establishment of the state of Israel makes good sense from the perspective of American national interests. And so uh, the, um, but nevertheless, Truman was, was a very unusual, in his own administration, uh, uh, as being both the man who launched the Cold War uh, in the Truman Doctrine, uh, and also uh, the exception being to the rule in his administration of, of supporting uh, uh, the establishment of the State of Israel. The establishment of the State of Israel, just one more, was, was a sideshow. Uh, the main event was in Europe. Uh, uh, with the beginning of the Cold War. So that's what I would say about Truman. I'll give shorter, shorter answers. Very, no, 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 very 
helpful. Thank you. So the floor is open. Press the button, the raised hand function, or wave through the screen. If I miss you, Michelle will get you. And Arch, I see you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Sir. Great. Um, Jeff, two quick questions. First, can you say a little bit about the mainstream Republican attitude at the time, and especially uh, the anti-subversive wing, which became the, the McCarthy wing of the party, what was, what was their attitude at the time? And second, um, there was at the time uh, an active anti-Zionist movement in American Judaism. And I wonder if you could indicate what their influence uh, might have been. Those are uh, excellent questions. Uh, the um, uh, in the leading Republicans uh, who supported the Zionist project was with Robert Taft. Uh, it's it, and I, I didn't go into great detail about Taft. There is there is a book about Taft and Zionism. Uh, 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 the um, uh, he was quite emphatic. He he, he was not a, a he. Uh, he co-signed or co-authored a resolution in the Senate with Robert Wagner uh, in support of the establishment of a Jewish state. So he, he wasn't just, he was, on, was not on the sidelines. He was very emphatic. Um, and then there were Jacob Javits and uh, some of the, 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 the Midwest and Northeast Republicans. Uh, I did not look into, I'm from Wisconsin, so I, I didn't look into McCarthy's views on the Jewish state as uh, the uh, 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 one of the things, um, Arch, that, that, that is apparent from uh, reading the State Department files is how concerned George Marshall was about this issue of KGB and KVD agents in the refugee stream coming from Europe to Palestine. Uh, the British kept talking about that. And, uh, and Marshall was worried about it. And, uh, and that his worries and concerns are evident in uh, that filters into the department. And you can see people writing memos from, uh, from Marseille or from uh, Vienna or, or Berlin in which they hear Marshall's concerns and they are looking very closely at whether or not the Soviet Union is, is in fact sending agents to Palestine in the refugee stream. So the issue of, uh, with Marshall and with Kennan, you have a State Department that is launching the Cold War. Of course, they're anti-communist. It makes it all the, I mean, it, among the many absurdities of McCarthyism was, was attacking these people for being soft on communism. It's just that that, 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 that is, as for anti-Zionism anti in the American Jewish community, it became, it was, it was a phenomenon before the Second World War and the Holocaust, but much less important after. Uh, there, uh, uh, Judah Magnus was a uh, uh, had would, you know, faculty member at Hebrew University, and, and Magnus was an anti-Zionist. He wanted a binational state, and 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 he, uh, Loy Henderson, in the State Department, uh, was um, uh, uh, a fan of, of, of Judah Magnus. But I think uh, the. The opposition to Zionism in the Jewish community in the United States became a really uh, marginal phenomenon uh, in in the wake of the Holocaust. Uh, I, it, there was, um, uh, I think, anti-Zionism in the United States was was primarily uh, a a right wing phenomenon, and uh, it was uh, uh, yeah that that that's I, I didn't explore that. It, 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 you know, in, in great detail, but uh, anti-Zionism was associated with the oil industry as well, and uh, the uh, and big oil. Uh, uh, the William Eddy uh, had been American ambassador to Saudi Arabia. Uh, he uh, translated uh, for Roosevelt at the meeting with King Saud in 1944. Uh, he uh, Marshall hired him as a consultant in the State Department uh, in, I think it was 19, when he became Secretary of State in 1947. So, uh, and Eddie uh, wrote a flaming memo, uh, well-informed, but very emphatic, that influenced Kennan a great deal. Uh, uh, that uh, the Eddie memo, of, of, and memos of fall 47, 
are about how this is going to be a disaster for the American oil industry. Uh, American educational institutions are going to be attacked. Uh, he filtered, he reflected uh, the views of, uh, of not, the, not the Muslim Brotherhood, but the, but the, 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 the Arab establishment. Uh, and uh, so that was, uh, that was the way things, that, 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 that's, the, that's the way the discussion went. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, I think that, that's what I have to say about that. So, Jeff Arch, thank you very much. Neil, good to see you and welcome. And you have the floor. Uh, good to see you. Thanks very much. Uh, fantastic talk. Um, two questions. First, uh, one of the troubles, as you know, of studying the founding of Israel is the paucity of material regarding Arab deliberations. And I was very interested in your comments on the Arab Higher Committee on the, you know, the public front, what we can learn from public statements. Did you find anything in terms of internal diplomatic, political, military considerations of the Arab Higher Committee in 47 and 48? Because that's been one of the darkest parts of general understanding about the War of Independence. We have public statements, but we've had very little of their internal diplomatic things. So very interested in you. One of the things that I think the State Department today should do uh, is to insist that the, the Palestinian Authority uh, uh, make available its archive. That's right. I mean, this uh, is and uh, you, you, you're, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, the uh, um, uh, and the Egyptian government should should open up its its files and the files of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, absolutely. And uh, uh, the um, uh, you know we 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 do what we can, but we we can't we can't work with 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 files that are not available. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, I, I all talk about normalization of relations and improving uh, diplomacy should should include insistence on opening up those files. Mm -hmm. yeah. Totally. Um, second, but, but I but I also would would, would say this that uh, that uh, historians uh, understand that 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 often the pu the public documents are neglected, and uh, so I would urge the. Uh, the United Nations has an online system of documentation. It's a little tricky to use. Uh, you, and when you, you read the UN yearbook and then you use, you, know, you can find many things. And, uh, um, and sometimes people often, people say in public what they, what they mean in private too. Yeah. Um, second question was, I wonder if you maybe overstated a little bit um, how uh, closely aligned British policy and American policy was, particularly in 47, and 48, because after the British decided in 47 to hand over the mandate, their interests, I mean, they clearly pursued an anti-Jewish policy in many ways, but their interest was not opposed to independence. It wasn't supporting a vibrant Jewish independence. Whereas America, as you know, you know, wanted to put in a trustee, try, you know, they had a plan for UN forces, all kinds of schemes that came up with to keep Palestine under some kind of international jurisdiction. And that actually conflict was something the Zionist leadership exploited pretty, pretty successfully. I would the, say. the the trusteeship support proposal was supported by the British as well. Um, the uh, uh, the the British Foreign Office was the driving force, and uh, the so he, so from the perspective of Washington, who are you going to support? Uh, the bunch of Jews in Palestine who don't have a state, or the the declining but still existing British Empire, with whom we just fought the Second World War to defeat the Nazis, so that that was that's the 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 um, uh, there were um, uh, uh, regarding the Exodus affair uh, 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 then tensions with Britain became an issue uh, in Washington because the um, uh, it, it was such a, a, a diplomatic fiasco that, uh, you know, these poor people on these ships and the British wouldn't let them in. And it was just a, uh, and, and it, it, it was a real uh, political debacle for the British. Uh, and th there the, the State Department was urging them to, to be more, uh, to basically let more people in. Uh, and it, there, yes, and so you're right, there were tensions, the, the, clearly. Um, and the, but the interesting, the, the more tensions there were between the British and the Americans over the state of Israel or the, the Zionist project before it existed, the more people in the State Department were convinced that this was part of Soviet policy 
to split the, uh, the Americans and the British from one another. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, but it, you know, I, uh, so I would push back a little bit if I understood your comment correctly, because by summer of 48, and that's why the Bernadotte plan is so interesting and important, that the Americans and the British are working together. Uh, uh, I mean, is, it, did you have, did, is that what you had in mind or? No, no, I agree that after independence is after after May 48, then I see those purposes coming together. It's just over this 47 before you could say, you know, up into spring 1948 when Britain was committed to, leave, you know, leaving, had obviously a plan to reinforce Jordan and so on. And that worked somewhat against the purposes of, as you say, they, you know, they, they provided some general support for the idea of trusteeship, but doing nothing to implement it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, Marshall was There's frustrated. American... With, yeah. And I see what you mean now. Marshall yeah. was frustrated with the British uh, in the summer of 47. So you guys are, you, you, I'm, I'm being, I'm speaking colloquially now. So you guys are talking about leaving uh, and, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're worried about containment in the Soviet Union. And that's, so that was what the Pentagon talks was about. You know, how are you going to manage British withdrawal? And um, then what role was the United States going to play to replace Britain uh, as the container or the, or the bulwark or something like that? But uh, the, uh, have you read the Pentagon Talks papers? Uh, some of it, not that part. Yeah, of it. I found them very interesting. And uh, uh, it, uh, but that Anglo-American bond, uh, you know, formed during, there was a special relationship and, the, and it wasn't abstract. These people were friends with one another. I mean, they, they, they had, you know, knew each other. And uh, so, uh, and British intelligence is very important because a lot of what the United States understood or didn't understand about Europe and the Middle East, you know, was filtered through British intelligence. So thank you, Neil. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we have about eight, nine minutes, one, perhaps two questions. And we go now to Michael Friedman, please. Hi, I uh, apologies. Good. Um, so, hi, Dr. Herf. Um, my question, and I know historians don't like being asked to speculate, but given what we've learned about um, Franklin Roosevelt's attitude toward toward Jews, or at least his casual use of, of harsh at times rhetoric, could you maybe speculate a little bit on how things might have played out had Roosevelt survived? Oh my! Well, it, I I agree with you about the dangers of speculation. Um, the uh, I think that um, that uh, I think Ro Roosevelt would have emerged as a strong supporter of the establishment of the Jewish state. Um, his personal friendships with Wagner, with uh, the spirit of the New Deal. Uh, uh, I, uh, his wife, uh, and 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 most important, his own his own convictions uh, were. Um, uh, if anything, Roosevelt, you know, often criticized, as you know, uh, for being too soft on the Soviet Union, at Yalta and other things, uh, would have welcomed uh, the Soviet support for the State of Israel, and uh, uh, the. So I think that the Roosevelt administration would have been even more supportive and more unified in its support. It's possible that a Roosevelt administration might have sent arms to the Jews. Um, uh, as Ro Roosevelt uh, was hoping to sustain the anti-Hitler coalition. Uh, um, but again, as it, you know, the spirit of your, your, your question is on the mark. I mean, I'm speculating, but... Uh, I think uh, I am not one of those historians who think that, uh, well, I don't want to get into the whole debate about Franklin Roosevelt and, and the war and the Holocaust. It, it, but, but, but from what I, from what he said it, uh, in the Democratic Party's election campaign platform of 1944 and his correspondence with Wagner, uh, uh, he was uh, quite sympathetic uh, to the Zionist project. Uh, and his, he was characteristically vague and ambiguous uh, when he spoke with King Saud. Uh, but um, uh, it's, 
I think that he would have been at least as supportive as Truman, put it that way. Maybe more. Michael, thank you. And Jeff, thank you very much. Jeff, I'd like to take you back to the beginning of your comments. Um, I can't recall whether this was an exchange, in exchange with you by email or in the book, but we've talked about the relevance of such history to today. Yeah. And you mentioned at the top, your engagement with students today on the subject of Israel. When you're presenting the book or talking to students about the book, what is the argument you advance on why this history is important? The worst thing that a young person can be accused of being uh, in the United States today uh, is to be a racist. Uh, and if you're an 18, 19, 20, 21, and you're on campus and people are describing the state of Israel as a racist phenomenon, it's very, very difficult. One of the great, uh, uh, so uh, uh, one, of the, one of the purposes, one, one of the aspects of the book that I think is important uh, for today is to recast that, that issue. Um, uh, to remind people that Zionism emerged uh, as a reaction against racism and uh, obviously against anti-Semitism, uh, uh, that, it, that, it, that the Zionist generation was, uh, of course, Jewish, but a, a kind of secular Jewish uh, generation. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that the issue of racism needs to be reconfigured. And uh, the history of Nazi collaboration of the Arab Higher Committee needs to receive much more attention for young people and, uh, and or readers today than it has. Uh, I think uh, I have found one of the great ironies of uh, discussion about Israel in the last 20 years has been a, ph a phenomenon such as Hamas, uh, which is a profoundly reactionary phenomenon and uh, one that has connections to the Muslim Brotherhood. And, that these movements of the extreme right uh, uh, find so much, uh, or find at least some, uh, sympathy among people who regard themselves as liberals and leftists in Britain and the United States. So it's not a, this is not Fidel Castro or Ho Chi Minh or Orthodox <laughs> communists. The, the, these are real reactionaries. And uh, uh, why people who think of themselves as liberals or advocates of human rights uh, uh, look favorably or make excuses for that is, is is a mystery. And so one of the things that the, the book is an attempt to do is to remind people uh, of what liberals in New York and in Washington uh, or socialists and communists in France were saying in 1945, 46, 7 uh, about this phenomenon. And uh, it, uh, yeah, I think that that would be a uh, uh, and the notion that the Brazil was a product of American imperialism is simple ignorance. I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Soviet Union was embarrassed subsequently uh, by its brief period of pro-Zionism, but uh, the diplomatic support and the weapons, they came from the Soviet bloc, not from Britain and the United States or France. So th th those are, I, th I think, uh, uh, those are things that I, that I would want to, uh, to enter into the policy discussion now and, and discussions on campus. So thank you. Uh, we have a hard stop in four minutes. Patrick, forgive my unfairness to you. Can you formulate your question or comment in one minute and give Jeff three minutes to reply? Is that doable? Yes, I can maybe even try better than that. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for writing the book and talking about it so elo eloquently. Um, my question is about uh, the role of, of France in, in those years, because we have talked about uh, Russia and, uh, and, and, and Britain and, and the United States, but not France. I mean, France has been a staunch supporter of Israel in the 50s and 60s until 50, 67. But can you tell us a little bit about the years you, you covered, uh, you know, 55 to 58? Thanks very much, uh, the, Patrick. The, um, I enjoyed working in Pierre Fitte in La, uh, La Courneuve a great deal. Um, and uh, uh, the first time I worked in French archives, uh, the, the, for me, that's some of the most fascinating and important parts of the book. Um, that um, uh, 
because the French, the French foreign ministry took a view that was comparable to that of the British and American uh, uh, foreign ministries. The uh, uh, after the Soviet Union, uh, after Stalin reversed position in the fall, uh, uh, the, the fall of '49, and uh, abandoned and became uh, hostile to Israel, uh, the Israel's most important ally in the world was France. Uh, no question, much more important than the United States. Uh, France uh, uh, gave Israel its nu- the technology uh, for the nuclear program. Uh, the Israeli Air Force was, was based on the f- famous French Mirage jets, which uh, with which Israel could uh, help win the '67 war. And that support, the book is, in my view, and there's more work to be done. The book, in my view, is about the origins of that sentiment in France, which was a legacy of the French resistance, of the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, uh, pro-Zionist Gaullists. Uh, and uh, the, um, so the, the France, especially the Interior Ministry, uh, and uh, Jules Moch and Edward de Preux, uh, Adrian Tixier, who died much too young, uh, all played a very significant role in working with the Mossad, uh, uh, not on cloak and dagger things, but, uh, but to facilitate uh, Jewish immigration coming from Eastern Europe and then through Marseille. So Marseille plays an important role in the book. And I hope, I'm so glad you asked that question because I, I really, uh, I hope the book gets a reception in France and uh, uh, the, uh, b- because uh, the role of France has been much neglected uh, in this in this history, and it is vital. So, Jeff and Patrick, thank you very much. Thank all of you for making time. Jeff, it was so good of you to spend the better part of an hour with us to present this. Again, the full title of the book, the book is Israel's Moment, International Support for and Opposition to Establishing the Jewish State, 1945 to 1949. It is getting attention. I'm delighted to know and report that Cambridge is out of books and they are replenishing. That's an early, very positive sign. But to all of you, thanks for your time and and questions and interest. And Jeffrey Herf, great to see you and congratulations. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's a pleasure uh, seeing you and talking with you and and talking and hearing these questions and comments. It's it's a real pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks so much.